Welcome back. Let's learn about spherical coordinates. All right, so in the last lesson, we looked at the first of two alternative 3D coordinate systems. And that system was the cylindrical coordinate system, which is essentially just polar coordinates, but with a Z coordinate. But now in this lesson, we are going to look at the second alternative 3D coordinate system, which is the spherical coordinate system. And the reason we have these different 3D coordinate systems, the rectangular, the cylindrical, and now the spherical, is because each of them has their advantages and disadvantages, particularly when it comes to representing different types of surfaces in 3D space. Some surfaces are easier to represent in rectangular, some of them are easier to represent in cylindrical, and some of them are going to be easier to represent in spherical. And you will see how that comes into play as we progress through the topics of Calculus 3. But for right now, we need to introduce the spherical coordinate system. And just like with rectangular coordinates and cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates will still have ordered triples. You will still have points that feature three coordinates, but what those coordinates actually are is going to be a little bit different. But before I introduce those coordinates, it's going to be important for us to look at how we have represented points in 3D space so far. So if we take a look at a point in 3D space, let's say we have a point right here, we'll call that point P. In the rectangular coordinate system, we would represent that point with an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, and a Z coordinate. All right, so this point is above the X, Y plane, so it would have a shadow in the X, Y plane, which would correspond to a specific X coordinate and Y coordinate. All right, so this distance right here would represent the Y coordinate, the distance along the Y axis to that shadow point, and then this distance right here represents the X coordinate or the distance along the X axis to that shadow point for our point. And then of course the projection of that point in the X, Y plane or that point's projection, the distance from that projection to the point is the Z coordinate. That's how we plot points in the rectangular coordinate system. But now if we were going to use the cylindrical coordinate system, we would represent our point with a radius R, an angle theta, and a Z coordinate Z. The Z coordinate remains the same, but R and theta are going to be different coordinates. R, the radius, represents the distance from the origin to the shadow point of that point in 3D space. So this distance right here, that represents R, and then theta is the angle of the radius from the positive X axis. All right, so this angle right here from the positive X axis to that line for the radius R is the angle theta. And so by measuring that angle and the distance from the origin to the shadow point, you could then use the Z coordinate for that point to plot that point. All right, so that's how we would plot a point in rectangular coordinates and in cylindrical coordinates. Now let's talk about spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates will look like this. We still have an ordered triple where the first coordinate is represented by the Greek letter rho, which sort of looks like a lowercase p. And what this coordinate represents is the distance from the origin directly to the point in 3D space. All right, so you could draw a line segment from the origin to the point, and that would represent rho for a set of spherical coordinates. And really how you wanna think about this coordinate or that value of rho is you wanna think of it as the radius of a sphere, okay? Because technically in the spherical coordinate system, the system would be made up of concentric spheres, sort of like how the polar coordinate system is made up of concentric circles, where you measure a radius around those circles. In a spherical coordinate system, you would have concentric spheres where you are measuring the radius to those different spheres, which we would represent with rho, okay? So you wanna think of rho as the radius of a sphere. And something important to know about rho is that it will always be greater than or equal to zero. All right, you will never have a negative value for rho in a set of spherical coordinates. This is different than cylindrical coordinates where the radius could be negative. That does not happen for rho in spherical coordinates, okay? So rho is always going to be positive. So that's the first coordinate. Now let's move on to the second coordinate. The second coordinate is theta, and theta is exactly the same here as it was in cylindrical coordinates. Theta is just the angle from the positive X axis, all right? It's the same as cylindrical for values of the radius greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so you measure an angle from the X axis, and if you think about a plane cutting through that angle in a 3D coordinate system, 
within that plane that would cut through that angle, somewhere within that plane, that point would be contained. Okay, now where exactly in that plane the point will be located is dependent on the third coordinate, which is represented by the Greek letter phi. Now some people will pronounce it phi, but I prefer to say phi. That's just the way that I was originally taught to say it, so that's how I'm going to pronounce it throughout all of my Calc 3 videos. And what this coordinate of phi represents is the angle from the positive z-axis to the line segment from the origin to the point. So we're talking about this segment right here represented by rho, the distance from the origin to our point. This coordinate of phi does represent another angle, specifically the angle from the positive z-axis to that line segment. All right, so this angle right here is phi. And what's important to know about this angle phi is that it can only be between angles of zero and pi. All right, phi must be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to pi. You will never have an angle greater than pi or an angle less than zero, okay? So you won't be working with negative angles for phi. And so just like rho, phi will always be positive. The only coordinate that can be negative for a set of spherical coordinates will be theta. Theta is the only coordinate that could be negative. All right, but the reason that we define phi in this way, the reason why it can only be between zero and pi is because if you were to measure an angle greater than pi from the z-axis, right, an angle of pi is 180 degrees. So if you measured pi from the positive z-axis, that would take you right here to the negative z-axis. If you went beyond an angle of pi, well, you could just measure that angle from the positive z-axis this way, and that would be an angle less than pi, or less than 180 degrees. Okay, so to sort of help you visualize how we plot spherical coordinates, don't get jump scared, my hands are going to show up on the screen here. If you think of this pen as being the distance from the origin to our point P, so that would make the pen rho, or in other words, the value of rho determines how long this pen needs to be, then if we were going to plot our point, using the other two coordinates for spherical coordinates, theta and phi, we would first measure that angle of theta from the positive x-axis. So that would look like this. We would measure our angle from the positive x-axis. And then once we have measured it, the pen stops there. All right, you are now stuck in a vertical plane at that angle. And so then the angle of phi would tell you where in that plane you are. You can only move this pen up like this, or down like this, depending on that angle of phi. You are stuck within this vertical plane. Okay, so that's why it only makes sense for angles of phi to be between zero and pi. Because if you go below zero or over pi, then you would be taking your pen to a different angle of theta. And that's not what we wanna do, right? We wanna stay at that angle of theta that we originally measured. And the only way to do that is to measure an angle from the positive z-axis between zero and pi. Okay, so hopefully this is a good visual demonstration of how we plot points in the spherical coordinate system. Really, you just wanna think of it as measuring a point somewhere within a sphere where rho is the radius of that sphere, and then the two angles, theta and phi, tell you exactly where along that sphere you are, okay? One more thing that I do wanna mention here is that if you remember, in polar coordinates and cylindrical coordinates, our points were not unique. We talked about how there is an infinite number of ways to represent the same point in both polar and cylindrical coordinates. The same is true for spherical coordinates, but it's a lot simpler to find equivalent sets of points because phi can only be between zero and pi and rho is always positive. So the only coordinate that you can really mess around with is theta. You can keep adding two pi to your angle of theta and you will get sets of spherical coordinates that represent the same point because if you add an angle of two pi, well, that just takes you in a full circle back to the same angle from the positive x axis within the spherical coordinate system. Okay, so now that you've been introduced to the spherical coordinate system, what we're going to do throughout the rest of this lesson is look at how we can convert from spherical coordinates to our other coordinate systems, that being the rectangular coordinate system and the cylindrical coordinate system because now we know that for a point P, we can represent it with three different sets of coordinates, right? We could represent it with X, Y, and Z for the rectangular coordinate system, or R theta Z for the cylindrical coordinate system, or now for the spherical coordinate system, we could represent a point with rho, theta, and phi. 
all right? And so what we want to determine here is how can we convert from these spherical coordinates to these other coordinates and vice versa. And to do that, similar to how we found out how to convert from polar and cylindrical to rectangular, what we want to do is make use of a triangle that is formed by these different coordinates. Remember that for polar in 2D and cylindrical in 3D, when we converted to rectangular, we made use of this triangle right here because this would be the X coordinate, this is the Y coordinate, this is the R coordinate, and then you have your angle of theta. That triangle related all of our different coordinates. The triangle we are going to look at this time is actually going to be up here. It needs to involve both phi and rho, our two new coordinates. And so that takes us to a triangle that would have that angle of phi and at least one side that has a measurement of rho. But what exactly does that triangle look like? Well, what you have to notice here is that this radius r, the measurement from the origin to the shadow point of our point, that could also be measured from the z-axis to our point, right? You could actually go up to the z-coordinate and the distance from that z-coordinate to the point would also be the radius r, all right? So this distance right here, that would also be r, and so that would mean that this side right here is represented by Z. And then what we have here is a triangle. And I know it doesn't really look like it, but this triangle is a right triangle. This angle right here is a right angle. It just doesn't look like it because the triangle wouldn't be flat on the page. It's extending outward at this angle of theta within 3D space. So the angle doesn't really look like a right angle, but it would be. And so if we take a closer look at this triangle that has an angle of phi, and then three sides measuring rho, r, and z, we can come up with some nice formulas to convert from spherical to rectangular and then eventually cylindrical. So let's take a look. All right, so here's our triangle that I just pointed out. We have an angle of phi down here, and then the hypotenuse of the triangle is rho, the adjacent side to the angle of phi is z, and then the opposite side is r. Okay, and remember from our conversion formulas for rectangular to cylindrical and vice versa, which we looked at in the previous lesson, and in fact, these are also the conversion formulas for polar to rectangular in 2D. You should be pretty familiar with these, but remember that x equals r times cosine theta, y equals r times sine theta, and tangent theta equals y divided by x. Okay, so we use these to convert from polar or cylindrical to rectangular, but if we want to change it so that we are converting from spherical to rectangular, we have to get rid of these r's, right? There is no r coordinate for spherical coordinates, so we have to replace r with something in terms of rho and phi. And so the question is, can we come up with an equation that tells us what r is equal to in terms of rho and phi from this triangle? And the answer is yes, we can use trig functions to relate the sides of a right triangle to one of the angles of that right triangle. In particular, we're going to use sine because if you remember so ka toa, or in other words, sine of an angle is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, cosine of the angle is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse, and tangent of the angle is equal to the opposite side divided by the adjacent side then what we wanna use here is sine because the opposite side to the angle of phi is r and then the hypotenuse would be rho. The longest side of the triangle is the hypotenuse. So sine of phi would be equal to r divided by rho, right? That's what we find here. Let's write that down. Sine of phi is equal to r divided by rho, okay? And so then we could solve for r here by multiplying both sides by rho. And what you'll find is that r is equal to rho times sine of phi, all right? We now have an expression for r in terms of rho and phi. This is exactly what we wanted. So now if we plug that in for r in these two conversion formulas, then what we will end up with is the conversion formulas for x and y from spherical to rectangular, all right? So if you replace r with rho times sine phi, then we'll have x equals rho times sine phi times cosine theta and y equals rho times sine phi times sine theta. Okay, so those are two conversion formulas 
from spherical to rectangular, we can plug in our spherical coordinates to get x and y in rectangular. But what about z? We still haven't found our z coordinate. Well, we could still find it by relating it to phi and rho in this triangle. Instead of using the sine function like we did to relate r to rho and phi, we can use cosine because cosine of the angle is the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. And the adjacent side would be z. That is the side adjacent to this angle. So what we would find here is that cosine of phi is equal to the adjacent side, which is z divided by the hypotenuse, which is rho. And so we could solve for z by multiplying both sides by rho. And that will give us that z is equal to rho times cosine of phi. And that would be the third conversion formula from spherical to rectangular. Okay, so given that you know rho, theta, and phi, you can plug those coordinates into these three equations and get your x, y, and z coordinates for rectangular. All right, but what about the reverse? What if we had our rectangular coordinates, x, y, and z, and we wanted to find our spherical coordinates? Because you can't really use these both ways. If you know what x, y, and z are, it's going to be hard to solve for rho, phi, and theta in these equations because those variables or those coordinates are not isolated. So we're going to need some different equations. And it's actually not all too difficult. If we start with rho, remember that rho just represents the radius of a sphere, right? And so if we use the equation of a sphere in rectangular coordinates, we know that it's x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and it's equal to the radius of the sphere squared. So we can just set this equal to rho squared, right? If rho is just the radius of a sphere, particularly one centered at the origin, then we know that that radius squared would be equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That's just the equation of a sphere that we looked at earlier in this course. So that's another conversion formula that we can use, particularly when we're going from rectangular to spherical. That's how we can find rho. But now what about theta? Well, theta is the same as it is in cylindrical coordinates, right? So we don't need a new formula for that. We can just go right back up to this one right here. Tangent theta equals y divided by x. You can find theta using this equation. So we're still going to use that conversion formula. And then finally, what about phi? How do we find that angle of phi from rectangular coordinates? Well, we can just make use of this equation right here, right? Cosine of phi is equal to z divided by rho. And if we already solved for rho using this equation, right, we take the square root of both sides to solve for rho, you would have the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. You could plug in whatever that value is in for rho, and then cosine of phi would be equal to z divided by that value. All right, so you could use this formula right here, or another way that you might write it is that cosine of phi is equal to z divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. All right, that would be the formula for solving for phi. Generally, I don't remember it this way. I just remember it as z divided by rho. And typically when I convert from rectangular to spherical, I solve for rho first. So then I can just plug it right in to that denominator. Okay, and then you could obviously solve for phi by using the inverse cosine function, just like how you would solve for theta in this equation by using the inverse tangent function. All right, and something important to note here is that when you do take the square root to solve for rho in this equation, you only have to worry about the positive value, right? You don't wanna write plus or minus the value of rho because as we discussed earlier, that coordinate, the value of rho, it can only be positive for cylindrical coordinates. So you're only interested in the positive value of rho. Okay, so I'll make a note of that here. Only use positive rho. Okay, so now that we found our conversion formulas from spherical to rectangular coordinates and vice versa, let's take a look at an example where we use these formulas. Hey there, real quick, before we get to the next part of this lesson, if you find my tutorial videos here at JK Math to be helpful, then I'd invite you to join my membership site, JK Math Plus, where you get access to many perks, including bonus content and my exclusive community. The bonus content includes dark mode versions of my videos, extra example problems, and more, while the community is a private space online where you can post questions, have discussions, and study together with me and other members. To learn how to join and see a full list of everything you'd get access to as a member, you can head over to jkmathematics.com plus. I will have a link for that in the description of this video.
Okay, so if you're interested in becoming a member, feel free to check that out. It's a great way to support me and the tutorials I make, as well as a great way for you to learn math better. But for now, let's get back to the lesson. For this example, we want to convert the point from spherical coordinates to rectangular coordinates. And our coordinates are 4 pi over 4 and then 3 pi over 4. And you'll see on this sidebar over here, I have our conversion formulas for us to reference, all of our new ones that we just found. But before we use any of them, let's identify what we're working with here. We're told that we have spherical coordinates, right? We want to convert this point from spherical to rectangular. So let's write down what those actual coordinates are. The first one is rho, right? So we know that rho is equal to 4. The second one is theta. So we know that theta equals pi divided by 4. And the third one is phi. So we know that phi is equal to 3 pi divided by 4. I highly recommend that you write this down every single time you are converting points from spherical to rectangular or from spherical to cylindrical, whatever. Whenever you were converting points from one coordinate system to another, write down what your original coordinates are explicitly like this so that you don't plug the wrong value into the wrong place in your conversion formulas. All right, try to stay organized like this. But now before we do use these conversion formulas, let's try to get a picture of where this point would be in a 3D coordinate system. Our angle of theta is pi divided by four. So if we measure that angle from the positive x axis, that would take us halfway to the y axis, which would be an angle of pi divided by two, right? This is an angle of pi divided by two. So halfway there would be an angle of pi divided by four. That would be our angle of theta. And so within that vertical plane, we will have our point, but where exactly is it? Well, that depends on our angle of phi. And our angle of phi is three pi divided by four. That's greater than pi over two. So we know that we're going to be past the y axis, right? If we're measuring this angle from the positive z axis, an angle of three pi over two is going to take us below the xy plane, all right? The xy plane represents an angle of pi divided by two or 90 degrees from the positive z axis. So if this angle is greater than that, which it is, three pi over four is bigger than pi over two, then we are going to be below the xy plane. Okay, so somewhere down here would be our angle of phi, and then our value of rho is four. So if we say that this line right here has a measurement of four, then right here would be our point four pi over four, three pi over four. If you wanna get a little bit more specific about where it's located, it would be in the fifth octant, or in other words, the octant below quadrant one of the xy plane. So you could think of this as being in quadrant one or octant five. That just sort of helps you visualize where that point is within the 3D coordinate system. But now that we know that, let's convert our coordinates here to rectangular coordinates and see if what we get makes sense. See if the resulting rectangular coordinates take us to the same area of the 3D coordinate system. All right, and so let's start by converting to x. We know that x is equal to rho times sine of phi times cosine of theta. So rho is four, so we'll have four times sine of phi, which is three pi divided by four, and then we multiply by cosine of theta, which is pi divided by four. And then for y, we would have y equals four times sine of phi, three pi divided by four, times sine of theta, so sine of pi divided by four. All right, and then let's set up z as well. z will be equal to rho, which is four, times cosine of phi, so we'll have cosine of three pi divided by four. All right, now sine of three pi divided by four is a square root of two divided by two, as is cosine of pi divided by four. So x is equal to four times the square root of two divided by two, times the square root of two divided by two. And so this four and these two twos will cancel each other out right? Two times two is four, and then you have four divided by four, which is one. So you just have the square root of two times the square root of two, which is two. So x is equal to two. And then for y, sine of three pi divided by four is still the square root of two divided by two. And sine of pi divided by four is also the square root of two divided by two. So once again, we have four times the square root of two divided by two times the square root of two divided by two, which is still equal to two. All right, and then finally for z, we have four times cosine of three pi divided by four. Cosine of three pi divided by four is not the square root of two divided by two, it's the negative square root of two divided by two. 
So this is equal to four times the negative square root of two divided by two. Four divided by two is two. So z is equal to negative two square roots of two. All right, so all together, our rectangular coordinates look like this. We have two, two, and then negative two square roots of two. That's our final answer here, but let's see if it makes sense. Would that take us to the same area of our 3D coordinate system? And the answer is yes. Both the X and Y coordinates are positive, so you would be in the first quadrant of the XY plane, but then the Z coordinate is negative, so you will be below the XY plane, so you would clearly be in the fifth octant, right where that point is in spherical coordinates. All right, so we know our answer makes sense, which means it's probably right, and it is. These are the rectangular coordinates that represent the same point that we were given in spherical coordinates. Okay, so that was converting from spherical to rectangular. Now let's take a look at an example of doing the reverse. Here we wanna convert the point from rectangular coordinates to spherical coordinates, and our point is the negative square root of three, one, two square roots of three. Okay, so just like with our previous example, let's write down what these actual coordinates are. This is a set of rectangular coordinates, so we know that the first one is x, the second one is y, and the third one is z. So we have x equals the negative square root of three, y equals one, and z equals two square roots of three, okay? So now that we have those written out explicitly, let's use them in the appropriate formulas to convert to spherical coordinates. And so let's start with rho, right? Remember that for spherical coordinates, we want rho, theta, and phi. Let's start with rho. We wanna use this equation right here. We'll have that rho squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So we'll have negative square root of three squared plus one squared plus two square roots of three squared. Okay, and then for theta, we wanna use this equation. Tangent theta equals y divided by x. So I'll write tangent theta equals y, which is one divided by x, which is a negative square root of three. And then for phi, we wanna use this equation. Cosine of phi is equal to z divided by rho. And so I'll write cosine of phi is equal to z divided by rho, but I'm not gonna write that in yet because we didn't solve for rho. Let's do that right now. If we simplify this expression, we will have that rho squared is equal to three plus one plus four times three. Four times three is 12 plus four is 16. So we have rho squared equals 16. So rho equals four, not plus or minus four because rho can only be positive. So it will be positive four. So now we can put four into this equation. Four will be in the denominator there. That is our value of rho. And then I forgot to put in what z actually is. Z is two square roots of three. So let's put that in here. We'll erase z and write two square roots of three. And now let's solve for our two angles. We'll start with theta. We'll have that theta is equal to the inverse tangent function or arc tangent of negative one divided by the square root of three. And so what angles for tangent would give you negative one divided by the square root of three? Well, there's actually two possible angles here. If we're looking at angles between zero and two pi, which is what we look at for theta, the two possibilities are theta equals five pi divided by six or theta equals 11 pi divided by six. And the way we choose which angle to use is going to be dependent on what quadrant or what octant our point would be in. And so we'll talk about that in a second. Let's solve for phi first. If we solve for phi, we'll have that phi is equal to the inverse cosine function of the square root of three divided by two, right? Two fourths reduces to one half. So you would have the square root of three divided by two. And so what angles for cosine would give you the square root of three divided by two? Well, we really only have one option here because phi can only be between zero and pi, right? Phi will never be an angle greater than pi. So there's really only one option here and that is pi divided by six. Okay, now we're almost done. We know that rho is four, phi is pi divided by six. We just have to determine the angle of theta. It could be either one of these two, but it can't be both. And so let's see where this point would be in our 3D coordinate system. We have a negative X coordinate. So that takes us to this side of the X axis and then a positive Y coordinate. So that will take us over here. So we're gonna be in quadrant two of the XY plane. And then the Z coordinate is positive. So we will be above the XY plane. So that means our point is in quadrant two, octant two. All right, so which of these two angles for theta would take us to the second quadrant? Well, 
that would be 5 pi divided by 6. 11 pi divided by 6 is almost 2 pi, so that would take us into this quadrant, which by the way, if you were to plug inverse tangent of this value into your calculator, it would probably give you negative pi divided by 6. That would also take you to the fourth quadrant here, which is where we don't want to be for this point. So in order to get the right angle, you would have to add pi, all right? Negative pi divided by 6 plus pi will give you 5 pi divided by 6. All right, so you always want to check to make sure that you have the right angle of theta for where your point would actually be located. So we don't want this one. We want 5 pi divided by 6. So our spherical coordinates here will be 4, 5 pi divided by 6, and pi divided by 6. That is the final answer to this example. These spherical coordinates represent the same point that these rectangular coordinates represent. And so if you actually wanted to plot the point using these spherical coordinates, 5 pi divided by 6, as we said, would take you to an angle right about there or so within the second quadrant of our xy plane. So that would be theta. And then the angle of phi is pi divided by 6. So if we measure that from the positive z axis, that would be somewhere about right here. All right, so this little angle right here would be phi. And so then you could draw a line segment here, say that that is a measurement of 4 for rho, and there's your point. Okay, not a perfect sketch of where that point would be in a 3D coordinate system, but he gets the point across. The point is in the second quadrant of the XY plane and the second octant of the 3D coordinate system. Okay, so that is how we convert from spherical coordinates to rectangular coordinates and vice versa. Now let's take a look at converting from spherical coordinates to cylindrical coordinates and vice versa. Now converting from spherical to cylindrical and vice versa is going to be a little bit easier than with spherical and rectangular, and that's just because spherical and cylindrical coordinates are more closely related, specifically that angle of theta is exactly the same. So we can start with that. We know that theta equals theta. That's probably the easiest conversion formula in this entire video. It's just like converting z from rectangular to cylindrical. They share the same z coordinate, so z just equals z. It's the same idea here. Spherical and cylindrical share that coordinate of theta, so it's going to be the same. The only two coordinates we have to actually convert are rho and r and z and phi. And really what these conversion formulas are going to become are just combinations of other formulas we already know. So really you don't have to memorize these. I sort of just think of it as combining formulas, but regardless, I will show you what they are. Remember from cylindrical that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. This is very important because if we're thinking about how to convert from r to rho, well, we know that rho squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So if x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared, we can just replace those two terms with r squared and we'll have rho squared equals r squared plus z squared. And that would be the conversion formula from cylindrical to spherical for rho, all right? Because both r and z are cylindrical coordinates. You can plug in those two values, square them, and then take the square root of both sides to solve for rho. So that would be another conversion formula, particularly when you're going from cylindrical to spherical. And then how would we get phi? Well, it would be exactly the same as in rectangular. We know that cosine of phi is equal to z divided by rho, and z is still a coordinate in cylindrical coordinates, so you can plug that z in, and then once you solve for rho, you can put that in, and then you can solve for phi. All right, so not a new formula. It's exactly the same as one we used earlier. It's just we're using it within a different context. I suppose you could also write it as z divided by the square root of r squared plus z squared, because that's what rho would be equal to, but I tend not to think of it that way. Instead, just solve for rho and then plug it into this formula when you want to solve for phi. All right, so those would be the three formulas from cylindrical to spherical, but then in reverse, if you're going from spherical to cylindrical, it's pretty similar. You would still use theta equals theta, obviously, and then you could find z by using this equation. You would just have to solve for z. You would multiply both sides by rho. That's also not a new equation. You could find z for cylindrical coordinates by taking rho times cosine of phi. All right, that's also not a new equation. We use that for spherical to rectangular. And then finally, this one's maybe not as obvious, but to find r, you don't wanna use this formula. Instead, we wanna make use of that relationship that we found earlier using sine on this triangle. We know that r is equal to rho times sine of phi. 
right? Sine of phi would be equal to r divided by rho. So if you multiply both sides of that equation by rho, you get this equation, which we already found earlier for our conversion from spherical to rectangular. All right, so if you wanna find r, you just take rho times sine phi. Something interesting about this equation is that it will be impossible for you to get a negative value of r because phi can only be an angle between zero and pi and sine will always produce a positive output for those angles. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. That's something interesting that happens because of the way that that angle phi is defined. You should never get a negative value of r when using this conversion formula. But with that, those are the conversion formulas for spherical to cylindrical and vice versa. And so let's take a look at some examples of using these formulas. Here's our first example. We wanna convert the point from cylindrical coordinates to spherical coordinates. And our point is four negative pi divided by six and then six. All right, so this is a set of cylindrical coordinates. So let's write down what those coordinates are explicitly. We know that r is equal to four, right? The first coordinate is r. Theta is equal to negative pi divided by six. That's the second coordinate. And the third coordinate is z, z equals six, okay? And then over here, you'll see the conversion formulas. I have updated it. I added in a couple new ones. In particular, r equals rho times sine phi and rho squared equals r squared plus z squared. Okay, so those are all the formulas for converting from spherical to cylindrical and rectangular. But now we wanna convert these coordinates from cylindrical to spherical, so let's do that. I'll start with the easiest one. Theta is not going to change, so we know that theta will still be equal to negative pi divided by six. That's easy enough. Then let's do rho, right? We wanna find that coordinate of rho. We know that rho squared is equal to r squared plus z squared. So we'll have rho squared is equal to four squared, that's r squared, plus six squared, which would be z squared. And so simplifying, four squared is 16, six squared is 36, and 16 plus 36 is 52. So we have rho squared is equal to 52. So rho is equal to the square root of 52. And then you can simplify that to be two square roots of 13. All right, so that's rho, and that will be positive. That will not be negative. And then finally, we want to find phi. And so cosine of phi is equal to z divided by rho. So we'll have cosine phi is equal to z, which is 6, divided by rho, which we just solved for. It's two square roots of 13. So we have two square roots of 13. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So we have cosine of phi is equal to three divided by the square root of 13. And this one's kind of tricky because if you take the inverse cosine of both sides of the equation to solve for phi, three divided by the square root of 13 does not correspond to a special angle. We don't really know what that is. You could plug it into your calculator to get a decimal value for the angle. And if you did that, you would find that phi is equal to 0.588. I'm not gonna leave it like that. But what is important to realize here is that that is less than pi divided by two because pi is 3.14 divided by two. It's at least going to be bigger than one. So this angle is clearly smaller than pi divided by two. So phi is equal to inverse cosine of three divided by the square root of 13. And that angle is less than pi divided by two. That's just helpful to know if you're going to plot the point in the 3D coordinate system. Altogether, our spherical coordinates would be two square roots of 13 comma negative pi divided by six comma inverse cosine of three divided by the square root of 13. Kind of an ugly set of coordinates, but that's what it would be. And if we were to plot that, we have an angle of negative pi divided by six from the positive x axis that takes us to about here. All right, so our angle looks something like that for theta. And then since this angle of phi is less than pi divided by two, we know that it's not going to go below the xy plane, right? That's important to realize. If you have an angle bigger than pi divided by two, you will then be below the xy plane. We don't in this case. So we know that our point will be above the xy plane. So you could just say that this is rho, which is two square roots of 13. And then at the end would be your point. Not a perfect sketch of where that point would be in the 3D coordinate system, but that's about where it would be given what we know about our angles. All right, so that was converting from cylindrical to spherical. Now let's do the reverse. Here we wanna convert the point from spherical coordinates to cylindrical coordinates. And our point is 36 pi pi divided by two. All right, so this is a set of spherical coordinates, right? So let's write down what those are explicitly. 
we know that rho is equal to 36, theta is equal to pi, and phi is equal to pi divided by two. All right, now if we were going to plot this point in the 3D coordinate system, an angle of theta equals pi will take us to the negative x axis. So that would take us right there. And then an angle of phi equals pi divided by two takes us from the positive z axis right to the x y plane. So our angle of phi takes us right to that negative x axis. All right, and so then we would just measure a distance of 36 for rho in the negative x direction. So that would be like this, we'll call that 36. And then this point right here would be our point. All right, so now that we know where that point would be located, we'll know if our answer makes sense after we convert from spherical to cylindrical. And so let's do that. Let's start by solving for r. We know that r equals rho times sine phi. So we'll have r equals 36 times sine of pi divided by two. Sine of pi divided by two is one. So this is pretty simple, r equals 36 times one. So r equals 36. We know that theta is not going to change. Theta remains the same from cylindrical to spherical and vice versa. So theta is still equal to pi. And then finally, we wanna use phi along with rho to help us solve for z because z is equal to rho times cosine phi. So we'll have z equals rho, which is 36, times cosine of phi, which is pi divided by two. Now this is even easier than what we did up here. Cosine of pi divided by two is zero. So this is equal to 36 times zero. So z is just equal to zero. So altogether, our cylindrical coordinates here would be 36 pi zero. All right, that's the final answer. And that does make sense. An angle of pi would take us from the positive x-axis to the negative x-axis. If the z-coordinate is zero, we're not leaving the x-y plane, so we stay there, and so then a radius of 36 would take us out to that point. Okay, so once again, with these conversions, just remember what coordinates you have and what coordinates you need. In this case, we knew we had rho, theta, and phi, and to get to cylindrical, we needed r, theta, and z. Okay, so you always want to keep that in mind. Now to close out this lesson, what I want to look at is spherical equations and graphs of surfaces in the spherical coordinate system. If you remember, at the beginning of this lesson, I mentioned that there are certain types of surfaces that are easier to represent in terms of spherical coordinates or with equations in spherical coordinates. In particular, that ends up being surfaces that are symmetrical about a point or are similar to a sphere in shape. We're not going to look at every single possibility, but I am going to show you some familiar surfaces that you've already seen and how they might be easier to represent in spherical coordinates. And the most obvious example of that would be a sphere, right? In rectangular, we represent spheres with x squared plus y squared plus z squared. In this case, we have a sphere with a radius of four. So that is then equal to 16, which is the radius squared. That's our rectangular equation for a sphere. You could convert that to cylindrical by replacing x squared plus y squared with r squared, right? So in cylindrical, that's r squared plus z squared equals 16. But it gets even easier in spherical because we know that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals rho squared, right? Rho is just the radius of a sphere. That's what it represents. So you could write rho squared equals 16 or more simply rho equals four. All right, and this becomes really nice much later on in Calculus 3 when we do integrals that involve surfaces because instead of representing a sphere with x squared plus y squared plus z squared, you can just use rho equals four and work in spherical coordinates and that's going to be a whole lot easier. And that's going to be a case for a lot of other symmetrical curved surfaces like spheres, but this is the most basic example of that. Now, on a less simpler note, we have vertical planes or specifically vertical planes that cut through the z-axis. You can represent vertical planes in spherical coordinates pretty easily. In rectangular, we would represent this with y equals x. And if you wanted to change the angle of the vertical plane, you would just have to change the slope of this line, right? That's really all this is. y equals x is a line in the xy plane that's being projected along the z-axis. In cylindrical, we represent vertical planes with just an angle of theta equals some angle. And that's going to be the same thing in spherical. But just to remind you where that comes from, if you divided both sides of this equation by x, you would have y divided by x equals one. But we know from our conversion formulas that y divided by x is equal to tangent theta. So we would have tangent theta 
equals one and tangent theta is equal to one when theta equals pi divided by four. So for this particular example, this vertical plane would be represented by theta equals pi divided by four. And that would be the same thing in spherical, except there is one slight difference. We would have theta equals pi divided by four, but really that would only represent half of this vertical plane, particularly the half that is actually along that angle of pi divided by four, not the angle of three pi divided by four in the other direction. So we could get rid of half of this plane here. And that is actually what would be represented by this equation in spherical coordinates. Okay, it's only half a plane because that's what this equation defines. It is a plane that extends from the positive z axis at a fixed angle. If you think about your spherical coordinates, that angle of phi, the angle from the positive z axis, can only be measured from zero to pi. You can't go further than that. So if we're at an angle of pi divided by four for theta, it only makes sense for our plane to extend in that direction, not behind at a different angle of theta. Okay, so in general, vertical planes would be represented in spherical coordinates with theta equals some angle c, and that would just be a half plane. Okay, now finally, I wanna take a look at one more surface, and that surface is an elliptic cone. In rectangular coordinates, we represent an elliptic cone with x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals zero, or at least that's how we would represent this specific elliptic cone that is directed along the z-axis. That's why the z term is negative. In cylindrical, you would replace x squared plus y squared with r squared. So you would have r squared minus z squared equals zero. And then you could simplify that further by adding z squared to both sides. So you'd have r squared equals z squared and then r equals z. So for cylindrical, that's pretty easy. r equals z is a nice equation but you could argue that it gets even simpler with spherical. If you remember what r and z are equal to in terms of rho and phi, I'm going to take it from this point right here, r squared equals z squared. We would have rho times sine of phi squared equals rho times cosine of phi squared, right? r is equal to rho times sine of phi and z is equal to rho times cosine of phi. We can then square both sides of the equation and have rho squared times sine squared of phi equals rho squared times cosine squared of phi. Those two rho squareds would cancel out. You could divide both sides by rho squared and they're gone. And then dividing both sides by cosine squared phi produces something interesting. I'm gonna do that over here. We would have sine squared of phi divided by cosine squared of phi, and that would be equal to one. But we know that sine divided by cosine is tangent at least when they are of the same angle. So this would actually be tangent squared phi is equal to one. And then if we take the square root of both sides, that would give us two equations. We would have tangent phi is equal to one and tangent phi is equal to negative one. So from this, we actually get two different equations because if you solve for phi by using the inverse tangent function, inverse tangent of one is pi divided by four and inverse tangent of negative one is negative pi divided by four. So you get phi equals pi divided by four and phi equals negative pi divided by four. This is interesting because what does this mean? Well, this equation, phi equals pi divided by four, that's giving us the top cone and phi equals negative pi divided by four is giving us the bottom cone. Or really this isn't negative pi divided by four, because phi can't be negative, right? That's not a thing. But if you were to add pi to this, really what you would have is phi equals three pi divided by four. That's what we really want there because phi can't be negative, but that would still represent the bottom cone. An angle of pi divided by four from the positive z axis takes us to here. And so if that is the angle for all spherical coordinates, you can see how that would generate this top cone. The angle from the positive z axis for all the points is always pi divided by four. In the same way, the bottom cone is made up of points that are always an angle of three pi divided by four from the positive z axis. So that would form that bottom cone. So at first it seems a little complicated because we have two equations as opposed to one for both rectangular and cylindrical, but these are a little bit easier to work with because it's just a variable equal to a constant value, in this case, phi equal to some angle. All right, so you can represent elliptic cones pretty easily in spherical coordinates. You just have to use two equations, one for the top cone and one for the bottom cone.
At least it's this simple if you were centered at the origin, which in most cases you will be. Okay, but that is all I wanted to talk about in this lesson on spherical coordinates. So if you want to get some more practice working with spherical coordinates, feel free to check out the examples video for this lesson that I'll have linked here on the screen. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, then that is it for now. So I will see you next time.